Um, so what's going on is that, that the C compiler translates C source code to assembly and the assembler will translate it to machine language. So we're gonna be running our C code primarily on the LC3. Now, the assembly that the C compiler produces is slightly incompatible with the online simulator you've been using to do assembly language. Now, it can, it can be fixed. You can go through and edit the assembly language so it would work, but then that, that's tedious and, and you'd have to know what you're doing. And so we have another simulator that does this on Vera Virtual that, that is tied in with this, that does run this code. Um, so that's the context of what we and what we're going to be studying is enough C to look at this process of C to assembly, right? The, the program that does this is called a compiler. And the compiler, def, in some sense, define the compiler defines the language. You sort of think of C or Java as an abstract entity, but what really defines the language um, is the compiler. And the compiler is supposed to implement like the design of the language, right? It's supposed to implement the, the language design. And, um, but the different compilers will produce different results. And what, one of these things, like, uh, probably you won't see this in this, but next semester you'll see this, uh, that the, um, uh, we have, there's two kinds, you guys are using two kinds of computers. One is an Intel machine, and there's a C compiler on that machine that translates it to Intel machine language and the instruction set that Intel developed. But um, there's and there's a few um, sort of legacy Apple Mac OS 10 machines that are that are also run on Intel chips, and that those run the same instruction set as the Windows machines. So you can, and that's why Vera Virtual works on both it's translating to the same instruction set. But some of you have the more modern M1, M2 machines that uses a different chip with a different instruction set that's not compatible with the instruction set for Intel. So it requires a different a different compiler because it's compiling it to a different machine language, a different instruction set architecture. Um, unlike say AMD and Intel, which produce different versions, they did produce different hardware architectures for the same instruction set architecture. Here we have two different um, compilers compiling one source language for different instruction set architectures. So that means, and, and that's um, the sort of the portability of C work has certain features that make it portable to different hardware architectures. But the different the thing is that certain things in C are different on the M1, M2 machine than the um, Intel machine. We won't see that here because we're going to the, we're, we're not translating it to um, the Intel or the um, M1 um, instruction set. We're, we're going to the um, LC, Three assembly language, because we want to understand the compiler process. What does C mean at the level of assembly language? So that you know when you when you go to Java, you will you and you have an instruction, you'll sort of have an idea of what that instruction does at a lower level, so that it's like hiding from you what's actually going on. What's actually going on is the is the binary language with the hardware, and so the, that that. As you go to higher and higher level languages, that um, moves you further and further away from that underlying reality. But for example, uh, malware exploits that and runs at the level of reality. It runs at the level of, of assembly language, machine language, so that um, any defects in your program that are due to your not understanding what's actually happening can be exploited by a malware writer to um, subvert your code or to break security protocols, things like that. Okay, so that's the context for C, but let's look now at the C language itself. C, well, let's look, what is a C program? A C program is a um, list 
uh, function definitions. Okay, a function is like a method in Java. It works the same way. However, C has no classes. C um, has no classes or objects, right? So it has no methods because methods are functions that are tied inside, inside a class definition. So a C program is just a list of function definitions. And um, so, but you can sort of see the history. You can sort of see archeologically that a Java program begins with that class that has a main method in it. A C program begins, a C program starts with its main method, main function rather, its main function. And so um, let's, so I think the point is now is that, that if, you, if you look through this chapter here, um, that, uh, well, well, let me just tell you the big picture so you sort of see what's going on. That because the C program is a list of, is a list of functions, executing functions is the primary task. Now, what, what the, the sort of the genius of the C, of the original C uh, originators, Dennis Ritchie and um, Kernigan and some other people in the 1970s, C dates from 1970. But still, if you go on to these th the, the, the indexes of the most used programming languages, you'll see the top three languages sort of switch around year from year, Python, C, and J Java. And after that, other languages have more niche uses or less, less common. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that, that just means they have niche uses, whereas the reason for that is that C has a special role as accessing different hardware. So when you have new hardware, you usually like if you want to have Java run on new hardware, then you have you write the compiler in C, if because it, it's it's because C allows you to touch the hardware, whereas Java doesn't allow you to touch the hardware in the same way. Okay, well, so the genius of 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 the ID now before C, the languages like the languages in prevalent use were Fortran for scientific computing, COBOL for business computing, and Lisp for artificial intelligence, and this was in the 19, developed in the 1960s. And these languages, well, apart from Lisp, COBOL and Fortran had subroutines that mimicked the subroutines in assembly, but they didn't have local variables. So you had to be careful that the variables in your, in your subroutines didn't um, match, didn't, didn't cause problems. I, you, you still encounter this with some, like some engineers use MATLAB, and MATLAB is an engineering language, and it's it's called matrix, whatever the mat in MATLAB is matrix. And it I remember having to write a program in MATLAB at one point in which I made a loop with the, uh, and I had my loop variable as the letter E. But that was a problem because E also is the name for Euler's constant, you know, E to the X. So I so I had overwritten an, an e. So now any functions like an exponential function weren't going to work properly because I had redefined it to be in a loop. It was one, then two, then three. And since I was doing something with exponential functions, it created chaos in the program because e wasn't a local variable. It was like a global variable that had a special meaning. So you have to be care you had to be careful now. What, what the C programmers did was they implemented functions by just not by calling a subroutine, but with a stack. Mm. Oh, is that excitement or? <laughs> <laughs> Someone who loves stacks. Okay. Well, we're not at IHOP, so I guess it won't be that tasty. Okay. So it's, what's a stack of is a stack of... Uh, activation records. So for example, 
on the bottom of the stack, there will be an activation record for main. And what is included here are, are all the local variables. I'm giving you the big, the big picture first. You sort of see what's going on. Now, let's say that main calls another function. You know, just like one method could call another method in a Java program. But what happens is when that function is called, let's say you is the function f, what happens is that the main record is put on hold. Main is put on hold, and another record for for the function is called, and it has its local variables. Now, main could have like the variable a equals five, and this could set up a equals seven. And this a and this a are different variables because this one resides in the activation record for f, and this one resides in the activation record for main. And then f could call another function g, right? And then you could go on, you could just stack them up. And these stacks work like the stacks that we have. Now, what? but there's a lot of technology involved in the format of these activation records. Each of these, there's an activation record for main, there's an activation record for F, there's an activation record for each um, function. And so, because this function has to, when it completes, so you push onto the stack, the activation records. When a function completes, it gets popped off. Right, because and there's a return. It returns a value, say to the to the um, can return a value to the calling function, and then when F G completes, it will be popped off, and F will resume execution at the same place where it was where it made the function called the G, and then F when it completes will pop off the stack and leave main, and when main pops off the stack, when it returns the function, the the program's in the program's finished. That's the end of the program. That's when it concludes. Um, uh, Java starts with, Java is a little bit different in the sense that it's it starts with with threads working active. So in, in the in a Java program, usually the main thread, the main stream of execution, um, starts a GUI thread. So the main function can complete and end without the program ending because there's actually a, a thread is a stream of execution where they share the same memory. So you can like have your main method start a GUI, GUI interface and then main can conclude and the program still running. Now job C has threads also, but by default, there's only one, there's only one stream of execution and you have to do something special with to, to, to have threads. So you can sort of think what you can sort of take as default when main completes, the program's done. Okay. Um, so that's the context. Now um, let's write our first C program, which is right here. Okay. Now we're going to do this on uh, Vera Virtual. So you should probably have Vera Virtual started so you can. Um, um, you know, do, um, work along with this. Okay, so um, in this interface, which you're not, most of you are familiar with this from previous courses, but if you're not, there's a start menu down here that has menu items. This um, light blue, may, maybe, I think it's just light blue, that's the icon for the text editor. This black one with a little dollar sign and underscores the terminal. We're, we're just going to, we'll, we'll only be using the terminal and the text editor here. And this icon here is the LC3 simulator. If you, if you click on this, you'll start, you should start the, it should start the LC3 simulator. So those are the only three things we're going to use. Now, if you look at the home direct, various home directory here, there's two directories. You might have not have all these directories, but the only ones that are relevant here are C, CPROG and the LC3 compiler. Now, I think you probably, let me uh, get rid of uh, these. No, I don't want that one. You should have uh, these three. Um, okay. We're going to rewrite this, so we may as I may as well delete this too. So this is probably what your CPROG directory looks like. 
there's should be two two uh, files a make file and std this stands for standard input output dot h it's a library file it's the only library file we have and all it does is support a printing to the console um so that is our context now the text does mention this other one here because we because we have uh, this simulator we don't really we really never have to go into this um because the simulator has this icon that starts it we don't have to go into this this um, directory here i think you can sort you can see that if you look at the properties this i this launcher launches the program lc3 compiler lc3 tools lc3 sim tk it it loads this simulator using a particular um, widget set called tk okay so we don't so if you use this you don't need to go in here okay so let's um start our first c program which is going to be um, this one here okay so you'll want to start the uh, the text editor. This is a real text editor. It's not very fancy, but it, it's it's got everything you need to you know um, um, type stuff. Now, um, uh, C has comments. See the single line comment. You should recognize this is the same as as uh, Java has, and then. Um, after that, there's um, something that's the analog of um, the analog of import, okay? Which is include. Now, the difference between import in Java and include, they perform similar functions. Import in Java, usually you import a library of class libraries, and all it does is alert the uh, Java compiler and the Java runtime where those um, libraries are. C works in a more elementary way. When when you it, see this little crosshatch, this this indicates this is called a preprocessor directive. It's not it's not part of C as such. It's not a C command. What it does is it's a message to the it's like a pseudo directive. You know it it's a message to the compiler to do something and. The only one we have here is include, the directive is include. What it does is it goes and finds this file and takes that file and inserts it as a global insertion of that entire file in your source code. So your source code now is this file plus your program, okay? So it just modifies the source code by including another file. Now the .h means it doesn't actually have C code, it has what are called headers. Um, in Java, you call them interfaces. If you if you made of C, it's like when you have uh, the header of a of a method, that's that has the name of the method, the return type, the parentheses with the arguments. That's the header. Okay, so um, it only includes headers and maybe some defined constants. So it doesn't have the actual C code for any of the functions. Like it has a header for printf, which is the 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 function like here, the function here, printf. Um, so so this just is, a, you, we need this for the compiler to work properly, but here's our first int main. Now you notice main can have an argument here, but it doesn't have to, okay? In Java, main has to have, you know, you have like public static void main um, string args, you know, in there. And the string args is what you get if you started a Java program from the command line. But you never start Java programs from the command line, usually. Um, so so it's not, so it's optional. And since the, since the, since the Java program is usually not run from a shell, it doesn't have a return type. Now, what, what the, the, the natural environment for running a C program is the shell. Now, this other, program here the the terminal is a graphical interface a text-based interface to a shell a shell let me write that down for you here in this somewhere okay
a shell is a um, language interpreter. Okay, so this terminal is by default an interface to the bash to the bash shell. Like for example, um, a uh, uh, the um, virtual terminal is a text based interface to uh, the bash shell. Um, the word bash stands for, um, well, the original, one of the original shells was written by someone named Warren, but not, not Jason. So he wasn't a spy, he was a computer programmer. But that sort of fell out of favor, but it was revived. So BASH um, stands for um, born again shell as a play on uh, the phrase born again from um, Christianity, okay? So that's the bash shell, but um, so when we when we run our programs, we run them with we run them we um, we uh, can run C programs from the shell. That is from a terminal. That's the that's sort of the native. That's sort of the native, sort of locale for um, C and for interpreter. Now this is still prevalent. For example, most of you, if you go into become software engineers, you'll work at companies that have database driven websites that they manage, and the servers that run those programs all don't have GUIs. So you enter. So you will inter You interact with your server. Um, servers almost entirely or, and most effectively with a, with a terminal, with a shell and via terminal, because the, because the servers don't have GUIs. Um, so um, learning sort of command line tools and stuff is part of the point of the course CS212 next semester. Okay, so this is all context where we can get back to our C program. Now, this is actually a valid C program here. Now, there's a convention that C programs are always named you, the, like you always write the name of the file, which is the program at the top. So we have to, we have to, we can save this as uh, hello.c. The extension it, .c indicates it's a C source code file, and we're going to always save all our files in C in the C prog directory. Okay, and once you save it, so it's good to save it early because once you save it. Uh, the text editor here, which is its official name is XED, um, X editor, uh, will color code your um, um, program according to C syntax. So here you see it, it's 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 um, color coding comments in blue, um, the include files in sort of light pink. The include the preprocessor directive in this brown built in types. Int is a built in type in Java and a built in type in C. And it, it basically means the same thing. How there's a slight difference. Um, Java types are always, the Java int is always going to be 32 bits, but an int in, in, um, in C could be 32 bits or 16 bits. It depends on the hardware. So that's why C, so, so that's, and so you have to come to terms with the fact that in a C program, the types don't necessarily mean in hardware the same things. That gives it the flexibility to deal with, with a, a hardware that has a small memory footprint that might only have 16 bits. So you could have a C program running on small hardware that wouldn't be able to run um, 
fancier languages. And the function, this is this is the header, int main. You put the arguments in here that you might have. And um, the curly braces include, just like you would a method, they include the code that's going to define your program. Um, so now the, the, the return type is when I would when I run, if I compiled and ran this program, I would start it on the command line and it would usually return something to um, the shell that started indicating whether it ran successfully or not, because the shell itself is a language for managing running programs. And so it's a management uh, tool. And there's, there's a course here, Linux Systems Management, I mean, which a large portion of that would be learning to, uh, the, the, the Linux shell as a, as a um, you know, to manage servers and stuff like that. Okay, so this is actually a valid C program. Um, for example, I could, um, okay, on the terminal here, this, if, if this, you're, you're, the, the metaphors for dealing with directories are different. On the desktop, you're used to a GUI metaphor for, full, for files and directories. Your metaphor is a desktop and you have folders and you open the folders by clicking on them and you see in the folder, the files as icons. Here, the metaphor is different. You're in a room, you're in a directory. So a directory is a list of files. So if I want, and so a directory is the folder. And if you wanna see what's in the folder, you have to list the, you're like in a room and you're blind and you have to sort of like, like issue commands in order to perform tasks that on the GUI, you just naturally, you just click on the folder and you see the files. Here, you'd have to type ls or list the files in the directory. So you're in a directory and you might wanna, let's think of a directory as a room and you might wanna move to a different room. So you move, you can change your direct, your working directory to cprog, which is where you wanna be. Now you're in a different room, you're in a different directory and you can type ls there and you see the files in that room. And you can see here we have hello.c, makefile, and stdio.h. Well, I could compile this program, which is which is basically doing nothing, and see if it works uh, with gcc um, um, hello.c um, dash. The, the command line syntax is you... You put spaces between tokens, and then uh, when when you run a command, there's a system of options. For example, here the the end, this is like a file, a source code file, and this is the this is the uh, GNU compiler collect, collection. It actually compiles C and C plus plus and Fortran and lit. It's, that's why it's a it's a compiler collection, and but you give it options. For example, dash the dash indicates the following letter is is a code for output, and so anything that follows the output is going to be the, the executable file. We'll always we, we would name our executable file the same as the name of the program. So you sort of know. Oh, there's hello is the executable. Hello.c is the program, and when I do that, if I get nothing back, silence is golden. That means it compiled without error. So this was a valid C program. Now. If I type ls to look at the files again, I see that there's my source code file here, and there is the executable. It's, it's green indicating it's executable. Now I can, uh, uh, there's a system for executing programs on the shell. And the problem is the shell looks in a standard set. Of, it assumes you want to run a system program like ls. Well, but it, it, it wants to, so it, it goes to certain standard rooms directories to look for executables by default it won't look in the current directory the name of the current directory is dot so if i want to run a program in the current directory i have to do dot but because dot be part of a file name i, I have to say well okay i want the i want in the current directory this thing is in so you can sort of think current directory the slash is says in this directory hello, and it runs. Of course, it doesn't do anything, but it, it runs without error. Okay. Now, one thing we could, we could, uh, 
continue with this little introduction to the mechanics of C is a function has a return, a method or function has a return type. We could return, say, the number 42. Now, 42 is unusual. Usually just return zero, but that is um, uh, more interesting because we know that we put the number 42 in there. Okay. So this is the cycle. I modify my program. I save it. You can see the little star up there indicate what one error you make in programming is to write your code in and not save the file. You probably were familiar with that with assembly. Um, you, you save the file, then here. Now on the bash shell has the nice feature, it remembers previous commands. So if you do up arrow, get the previous command, you get up, up arrow, I clicked on the, um, I pressed up arrow a second time. A third time, I get back the compile command. So once you type it once, if you typed it correctly, you don't have to type it again. Then I just press enter and it compiles it again. Then up arrow twice, I get the executable command. I press it again. Now, I wanna see that 42. Well, the 42 was saved in a bash variable. The bash variable, the name of the bash variable is question mark. But if I just echo question mark, I'm just gonna get the symbol question mark back. But dollar sign is the special bash thing that says, go inside and show me what's in the very bash only has string variables so it is it's meant for system administration so this is going to show me this echo will show me what's in the bash variable question mark which is the number 42. so when a program runs it returns the number it returns a certain number and the bash shell saves that that number in the variable question mark, which is 42. So it can then determine, okay, if it if it if this program returned 42, we do one thing. If it returned something else, it returns it returns something else. So then if I change this, for example, back to its usual thing, zero, zero means success. And then come back here and compile it again. And do I get zero, right? Now, the problem is that if I run any other command, for example, if I run GCC and then I run echo, echo, it will return zero because zero means success. The compiling succeeded. Okay, so that's so this is just sort of the mechanics behind the scene of running C programs from the, from the command line. We actually won't have to do this very much, but I want to show you the native environment that explains what this return type int does, why it's there. Because its design, its design is, I mean, when C was developed, this screen was the entire interface to the computer. When I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago, we had Sun Microsystem computers, Unix computers, and Linux is a version of Unix. They work the same way in the terminal. This was our entire interface, was the command line. There was no GUI. There was just this interface. Okay. Well, that's actually not quite true. They they did have one. They did have a minimal X Windows thing that, but, but the whole point of that was to start terminals. Okay, so here we are. We're, we're slowly making our way to our first actual um, C program, which is over here. Now we've got some of this. We've done the 42, but I put it back to zero. Okay, now, this, this program only has one line. Print F, hello, LC3, from, and what you want to do is put your name in. Instead of Zircon Z, you'll put in from your name, not my name, your name, and Every command, every every instruction in in every actual executable instruction C has a semicolon at the end, just like Java, right? You put you you indicate the end of, because C lines like Java lines are freeform in the sense that with certain exceptions you 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 don't have to indent, which and you always want to indent them. You always want to obey this indentation pattern where. If you have a block of code like this, you indent it to sort of logically set it off. Um, sort of like, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a religious matter whether you indent by two or four spaces. And so in this course, you can follow your own religion in terms of indentation. 
okay? Um, next semester, there'll be a restriction. You have to follow the uh, CS, the, the, you have to follow the um, CS212 religion and debt by a fixed number of spaces according to the divine dictates of that course. Okay, so uh, now, so we have a program, you save it. Now, we could compile it using the, uh, you know, doing this, we could go and compile it and then run it. And then you'll see a message, right? And you'll see that uh, printf doesn't put a space at the end here. You can fix that if you want to put a new line. That's called an escape code, right? So th that, that we see it's sort of annoying that it printed off hello LC3 from me and then, then left, then it, it brought back the command line. So if you press enter here, we'll go back and do that. But then if I compile it again, with the, um, the 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 escape code for the new line, and I run it here, then the output's on its own line. And it looks, that's sort of what you should do. Now, you may think that printf is special to C, but it is in Java also. And in fact, it's an important function in Java that you may or may not have been um, um, uh, seen before. You probably have done a print line in Java, right? But you should be using printf. Printf works the same way. Print line uh, prints it with a new line built in, so you don't have to use the escape code, um, right? Here, so printf is a method in the you know in the out in this in this whatever this class is in this library thing. So printf is a method in Java and it has the same syntax. The value of printf is it formats things nicely. And if you, um, so printf is the function to learn about. So anything you learn about printf in C, also you can carry over to Java. So, so learning about C can, you can help you with Java. Okay, well, this is our, this is our program, right? This is what you normally do in C, but we're not going to, um, and if I look here, we're not going to, going to do this. We're going to, uh, you know, you don't have to do this. You can leave it there. But we're going to say, well, we have a C program, and we want to compile this to the LC3 compiler. Now, this is done with the make file. Let's look at the make file. You want to be very careful at adding the, the make file is sort of like an archaic program style that has tabs in it and the tabs cannot be replaced with spaces or it won't work correctly. So you want to be very careful and not edit the not make changes. You go up here and open the make file and you can see that it is um, what it does is it's an example make file to compile a C source file into LC3 object code. Object code is the is, is the is the executable, okay? Now, the what the only thing we have to change here is the word hello, right? That word hello indicates it's you, you take the C off, you just have hello. It's gonna it's going to get the hello.c file and it's going to compile it. So here's the compiler directory, here's the library directory, and here's sort of the output. And there's another, whatever. We're, we're just going to use this for typing one thing. And what it does is, see this LCC dot C, what it does is it's going to, L, L, we're using LCC instead of GCC. So LCC um, is sort of misnamed. I mean, it's the GNU compiler collection. This is the LC3 compiler, um, which does your code. This is the symbol code. This is going to do hello.c-o hello.object. So, so instead of the executable here, the executable will be the object file. So that's all we need. So the, to run this, so all you have to do is, is, is when you make a new program, change the name after code. Don't change the spaces here, right? You can't, these spaces are there. Everything in here is here for a reason. So you only want to put in the hello here. And so this is okay as is. You shouldn't have to modify it. And so when you come down here, 
you just type make. And make file is a system for for when you when you run big C programs, you make a make file and it does all the configuration. And what happens is this is you see that if it, if there's no if you haven't made any errors, you can see it, what the the name it the program it ran was in the home directory in Vera in the LC three compiler subdirectory in the LC three dash one point three directory. It install it ran the program LCC hello.c-o, hello.object. You should recognize this from our GCC as the compiler name, hello.c, and hello.object. Now, if you've got errors here, that's another thing. You know, we might have got, you might have typed in something wrong, but this should work. You should have this. Now, it's a two-pass compiler. It does something like the, the, the assembler in which it will um, uh, make a, a um, a table, you know, for variables. And the second pass, it actually produces the code. This is what you want to see. Okay. Now, then if you do LS, you'll see that there's several files. There's your source code file, hello.c. There's an assembly file, hello.asm. There's a symbol file for the symbol table. And there's other files that are already there. So there's two files, hello.object and hello.sim. Let's say we want to run our program. Okay, well, you should be able to come over here and double click on the, the simulator token. And, and there's two separate windows. One is the, the console window, and the other is the end of the program that, that ran this startup routine. So you just ignore this stuff in here. So then you, then you wanna browse. And, and go to the C prog is here there and you're going to load the object file okay and um, what once it loads it you um, you can see here init code you're at x3000 right EDF so this is your program there's you can see the word hello but this is the assembly code produced by the compiler, okay? So then to run it, I think you just press, I think you can press finish if you press continue, then you see the same thing, hello, LC3 from Harold Riggs. And there, there's an extra new line here. It, it sort of itself, when it closes off, then it halts, because the LC3 only runs one program then stops. So you, what, your, what your first assignment here is to get all this working, we can work on errors. See, what we've done is the second one here, you don't have to do this from the command line. You can just use a simulator. Now at the end, what you wanna do is make a screenshot of the simulator console, um, which shows the message with your name. Okay, so if you come, come down to the start window here, under accessories, there will be a tool, take screenshot. Now, what you want to do is select area to grab, click, make sure that this is out of the way, take screenshot, and then you just select the portion of the window that you want. And then you can call this, um, hello, uh, say, screen, something like that. Or you can just call it, hello, with your initials because the PNG will do it, okay? Then you can see here, you have a screenshot that that I didn't quite, I got most of it, I didn't do it. Oh, I didn't do a very good job of getting the window. Okay, you probably do a better job. This cuts it off right there. Okay, then you wanna put that onto your work thread in Piazza. Now you may or may not be able to, to cut, there's two, the problem is, some, some of you have troubles getting, um, moving stuff back and forth and you can set up uh, a shared a shared folder. Uh, and I can help you with this, set up a shared folder. So there's a folder here that's the same as a folder on your desktop. But ultimately you can um, just know your password and start Firefox on uh, Vera Virtual and then as I haven't done, you'd have to get your password, your username and password, log in, then you can 
you can um, do everything you need to um, by posting this on your work thread in Piazza. Okay, well, that's our, that's our first class um, on this stuff. Let me...